So it's about time to start. So I'll, we might get a few stragglers come in. The after lunch session always comes. <coughs> you get the slow trickle. This is a DTM 5-3, Design of Complex Systems and Product Architecture III. Oh, that's three, okay, ha uh ha. -huh. Uh, so, sorry, bad humor after lunch, what can I say? I'm Rich Malik uh, from Texas A&M University. I am the session chair. We've got four talks in this session. Uh, we're gonna do, uh, so it might be a little shorter than in some other sessions because this is only an hour session. Uh, so we want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, our first talk comes to us by way of Denmark, uh, and it is, it is going to be uh, Jacob Har Harslow, yes, who is a PhD student in Denmark. Okay, and uh, take it away, Jacob. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to this presentation. I'm Jacob Harslow. I'm going to tell you about how we can enable reuse of documentation across different product families in new medical device development through a systematic architecting approach. So I'm just going to jump right into it. So this is a model showing uh, sort of the phenomena that, is, that the medical device industry is within. And as you can see in purple, we have some external influences down here. And in green, we have some of these internal factors that we actually have some control of. And so for several decades, we've seen that, the, that there's a you know, market globalization, which has caused uh, the companies to you know, compete for superior functionality. And as an effect of that, the product complexity has increased a lot. We have now starting to integrate lots of de technologies within the products. But you know, product development is not all, only about designing, but it's also about design controlling, especially within the medical device domain. And an output of that is are these design control documents, sort of the system requirements, specifications, or the verification test protocols. And as you can see here, uh, these documents are not only affected by an increase uh, in the product complexity, but also an external factor, uh, these uh, regulatory frameworks that are constantly being, being tightened, uh, which also all, all the time sort of changes the way we have to do documentation. So you can kind of see this, that there's a sort of a tension point here between the complexity of the products that are increasing and the regulation. And that really means that sometimes the cost of documenting your products becomes disproportionately high compared to the cost of actually developing the products. So our research question for this paper was to how can we enable reuse of documentation across product families while complying to these regulatory frameworks. So the case study that we've been looking into is uh, from Radiometer Medical. Uh, they do acute care diagnostics, so they measure on blood. And what they've also done is like they've, they've developed these uh, product families, which are blood collecting devices. They're called blood samplers. And this one is a little bit more sophisticated. It has uh, more uh, functionality than this, this one up here. So what we wanted to use the case for was to investigate if we had known these two product families beforehand, could we have somehow leveraged the information and reused some of the documentation for developing the next one and therefore uh, lowered our cost of uh, documentation. So how did we actually approach this? What was kind of our starting point of reasoning? And what we started out by asking ourselves was, what does it really take to reuse documentation? Um, and just by you know, interviewing different uh, stakeholders and uh, looking at the documentation, we found that if you can provide a sound rationale for why you, you want to not retest uh, a, a new system, then you're actually good. Uh, but then the question was, so what is really the nature of the rationale? How do you characterize that? And also, again, by analyzing different rationales, we found that it really has to do with understanding how the properties in a product are realized. So this is just shortly to give you an understanding of how we see you know, how we see properties are realized in a product. So fundamentally, we can view a product from a functional perspective and from a form or physical perspective. But what we also want to stress is that in between these two views, we have sort of intermediate views. So we product functions can have uh, functional properties and components can have different structural characteristics. So let, let me just give you an example. So we, if we have a blood sample and the, the function is that the blood filling, for example, then the functional property of that would be the time it takes for the blood to fill in the sample. And then we can start asking ourselves, what are the different components that contribute to the blood filling actually in the, the sample? And uh, that might be, for example, the cylinder or the, the, the plunger in the end. And what are the specific characteristics about the cylinder that actually has an influence on the time, which may be, for example, the inner diameter where the blood flows through. 
So as you can imagine, we can start to build these property models of how we understand the, the, how the properties in our systems are realized. And these are often not explicitly defined. They're like subtle and, uh, and typically uh, inherent in the, the senior engineer's head. But then uh, when we go ahead and build the system, then we need to actually understand if this was actually achieved. So what we actually do is that when we do our verification test, we actually test these property models to see if they actually came true. So as you can see here, we've kind of made a uh, sort of correlation between our product understanding and then our test view that we want to ideally have it one-to-one -one map. So this is the seven-step architecture approach that we've came up with based on this uh, case study. And uh, the, uh, we've used the matrix-based visualization methods uh, to visualize the product uh, architecture and other views. So what it basically, the first three steps has to do with understanding how the product is used by filling up this DSM understanding how the product works, the functions, and their interrelations, and understanding how the product is built. But what we also do is that we map in between the DSMs. So the product portfolio we map in here, and also the product architecture view, what, what functions relate to which components. And what, is, uh, what we also do is that, sort of from an upstream perspective, we also look at, so which components were tested up against which functional properties. And as well up here, which functions has to do with which use activities. Um, so this corresponds to a verification view and validation uh, test view. So after having done that, we go ahead and rate uh, these, uh, we call it links or cup couplings between the views. And that's based on a rating system which was inspired by Martin Nishi, uh, their design for variety paper in 1999. And um, after that, we go ahead and modularize the system based on an understanding of which components were carried over from one product family to another. And uh, what we can then start to see is uh, how the different tests span the common and variant components. But what we also want to do in step six is to sort of mirror the product understanding over in the test view to really expose sort of the inefficiencies that uh, we may have been doing. Um, and then at the last step, we would want to maybe decouple some of the property models in order to decouple the test and therefore reuse the test. I'm just going to step into the step five, six, and seven, and just skip the, the first four. So what you see here is uh, these, this total MGM, and as you can see, we've filled in all the, the uh, DSM and DMMs, and we've also rated the DMMs, DMMs based on our rating system. So what we did now was to sort of modularize it or reorganize this MGM based on which component were carried over from one product family to another. And, um, so you can kind of see that there's a sort of a platform here, uh, which is common across the two product families that has like a lot of uh, internal interactions. Uh, so in step six, we would actually want to somehow mirror the, the product understanding down here uh, into our test view to see, do these correlate basically. So what we I'm going to show you next is, I'm just going to extract these two functions here and then unfold sort of the view so what you see here is that we, on the two rows here, we have two functions. And for each function, we have a functional property. So they have many more functional properties, but this is just one functional property. And on the horizontal view, you see that each functional property actually have several tests that are documenting that functional property. And so there are four tests for the one and then four tests for the other one. And uh, what we can see here is, um, first of all, is if we mirror the product understanding over in our test view, we can see that there are actually some discrepancies between the views. So uh, based on our product understanding, there should have been this component here, which, uh, yeah, this, the, the, the mixing ball should have been included in that test based on our product property understanding, but it was not included. And as well, if we look at the pluses, they mean that we actually included a component that was not justified by our property understanding. So basically you kind of lock down your design by testing them together. And if you would want to re you know, make a change to the mixing ball, which was included in the test, then you'd have to retest. So that's very inefficient. But uh, going back to sort of the research question, would we want to reuse tests across different product families? So what is most interesting here is to see that some of these tests span the common and variant parts. So obviously in order to reuse the test, we want to isolate the test to the platform. And 
But if, if these tests are actually spanning the, the common invariant, because you know our property understanding justifies that, then in order to decouple the test, we must decouple the property model. So I'm gonna just take the last step, step seven, and show you how we did that. And I'm gonna specifically take the cylinder and the mixing ball as an example. So remember the first view we had about our pro property understanding of how uh, properties are realized in the product. So this is just the, the cylinder, uh, the common component, and the mixing ball, the parent components. And they have different structural characteristics, so like shape or uh, dimension or material surface quality. And they relate in different ways to these different functional properties, so gas diffusion weight or effective mixing, for example. But what's most interesting to see here is these relations that span across the varying common components. And, um, but I mean, if, if these are justified by our property understanding, and this is how we you know, know the system works, then we obviously need to test both the components in the test. But what if we could actually decouple these uh, relations here? So just to explain one relation is that, for example, the one from the mixing bowl to the gas diffusion. So the, the surface roughness of such a mixing bowl can actually uh, contain a little bit of oxygen. So when you put it into the system, this oxygen will diffuse into the blood and you will have a biased system. Um, so what you could do to avoid that is to First of all, you could understand your product better. You could uh, you could you know, vary the surface roughness and see how, how it impacts the gas diffusion and then set your requirements right. And if that is not sufficient, you could go ahead and change the design totally. And then, for example, lower the surf surface roughness so much that it, you actually it can't contain any oxygen. Um, so that's basically the two ways we see uh, how you can decouple the test and then reuse it across the product. So just a brief discussion points. Uh, one question that we've been asking ourselves, how do we actually know whether it's possible to you know, encapsulate a functional property in a platform uh, when we know that complex system has emerging behavior? So whenever we change something, you know, certain things because of complex interactions, they may uh, emerge. And another question, maybe for further research, how do, you, how do we actually assess the value of decoupling these property models versus retesting the system as a whole? So what is most cost effective? Is, is there a sort of a sweet spot? So in conclusion, our research contribution is this seven step architecting approach and the, the principle of mirroring the uh, MGM uh, from the product understanding into the test view. And the industry contributions are that we can gain better control of the product performance and quality through having this systematic understanding of how our properties are realized in the product. And obviously documentation reuse allows us for increased R&D efficiency because we can you know, spend our focus on the more, more value-added activities and then shorten the time to mine. So thank you very much for listening uh, on this talk and I uh, look forward to your questions. Do we have time for a couple questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, can you show us the uh, decomposition method? Yeah, and uh, and the first one. Yeah, first one. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you go from uh, maybe one before the previous one? Yeah, that one. Uh, now the more the, the real first one. Oh, uh, like this one. Yeah, this one. Okay. How do you go from verification to DNN to validation to DNN? So what we did was that. You know, this case was an analytical case. So we, what we basically could do was we could take these test protocols and we could uh, analyze them to see which test was performed uh, related to the different functional properties and which components did they actually include in these tests. So we we're kind of uh, blessed with having the, all that information together. That I guess in a, in a more synthesis uh, perspective, when you don't know, you know, you know what to test, then I guess this this method of you know walking down this uh, decomposition route and understanding how your properties are realized in the product will sort of enforce you to test the right properties and not test all components which didn't really have anything to do with that property. So, and then going up here from the validation was also a matter of looking into the test documentation, seeing uh, <coughs> which tests were performed. Uh, which test you know documented the, how the the use of the product 
what were the functions that were activated basically on the product. So this, uh, these transitions mm -hmm. or filling process, yeah. it's not that automatic because there's no, no. Okay. It's it's a it's a matter of using your expert uh, domain knowledge, okay. I guess, um, and uh, we also. In order to do the rating, that was very much yeah, interviewing domain experts yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. so it's not automated, no. Okay. As yeah. is. Okay. One real quick question. Yeah, it's very. Do you mean the same thing when you say functional performance as uh, performance characteristics or yeah. functional properties? Um, that's the, yeah, uh, that's a, a terminology thing, uh, okay. I guess. Um, I'm not sure of what you mean by performance, so, okay. so that's why I'm, I'm a little bit conjunctive. But Generally something that you could put in a requirement that goes 50 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah, true. That, that's basically it. That's what we verify in our verification tests. So yeah, sure. The functional properties are a performance characteristic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again to our speaker. I'm not sure you happen to answer any other questions at the end of the session. Sure. Uh, but uh, as always, we have to move on. Uh, our next speaker is